Well, as you know, uh, Boeing is a major part of Washington State's economy, and it's because it got its start right here, uh, actually, in the, the Seattle area. Uh, uh, William Boeing building planes in the Red Barn. And uh, there is a, a relatively new book about that story by author David Williams titled A Gift of Flight, The William E. Boeing Story. David is going to be uh, giving a lecture at the Museum of Flight uh, this Saturday, May 20th at 2 p.m. And uh, David is kind enough to join us. Uh, David, appreciate that. And I want to point out that David is the director of the Hydroplane and Race Boat Museum in Kent, and that's where we find him standing in front of uh, the uh, the original Boeing boat. So, David, why don't I have you start by telling us a little <laughs> about the boat? All right. Well, thank you very much, and I'm I'm thrilled to be talking with you. I am standing in front of a boat called the Miss Wahoo. Uh, it is a Allison powered unlimited hydroplane built in 1956 for Bill Boeing Jr. It gets a little confusing when you start talking about the Boeing family because there are four. Uh, successive generations where someone was named William E. Boeing. So the uh, the man that the book is about, William E. Boeing Sr., founded the company. The boat I'm standing in front of was owned by his son, William Boeing Jr. And that's sort of how I uh, established my relationship with the Boeing family early on was through restoring and, and building this beautiful replica of their family's hydroplane. Uh, and you were telling me before we started, too, that's how you that d developing that relationship is what led to the book. Tell us about that. Well, Bill Sr. founded the company uh, in uh, 1915 and actually left the company in 1935, came back for a while during the war. But he was very adverse to publicity. He didn't want any books. He didn't want any stories. He tried to keep a low profile. And for a number of years, the family respected that. Um, when we at the museum began to restore this hydroplane, I became uh, a close friend with Bill Boeing Jr. and also uh, a close friend of this boat's original driver, a man named Miroslav Slovik, who was sort of a Cold War hero and had defected from the Iron Curtain, had come to the U.S. and was uh, a big Seattle celebrity in the 50s. While writing the biography of uh, Miroslav Slovik, um, as I said, I befriended the Boeing family, and we told a, a good deal of Bill Jr.'s story through that book. And Bill Sr.'s de descendants um, looked at the book that I'd written about Bill Jr. and said, well, we trust this guy. He's going to get the story right. So they opened up their entire family archives to me. Uh, I, I can remember very vividly going over with the pickup truck and picking up 17 of those big, uh, you know, those, those type of Tupperware uh, totes that you might buy at, uh, say, a Walmart or someplace that's about a three foot long, a two foot wide, and two foot tall tote. They had 17 of those filled with diaries and telegrams and letters. Um, and I brought them back to my office and sat down and sorted through and organized them uh, and found uh, an amazing story about Bill Boeing Sr. and his founding of the airplane company. And that's the basis for the book. Excellent. Well, without giving away too much, Tell us a little bit about what we can find in the book. Sure. Uh, the first thing that people will be very surprised by is that Bill didn't make his money in airplanes. Uh, he made his money in lumber and in mining. In fact, uh, in 1908, years before he founded the company, he was the largest taxpayer in Washington state seven years before he ever uh, started playing with airplanes. That's pretty significant. And I think that has a a parallel to someone like a, a Jeff Bezos, who made his money at Amazon and then decided later to go play with, with spaceships. So maybe in 100 years, people will look at a Jeff Bezos and, and think of him as a space pioneer when we know he made his money uh, elsewhere. Same thing with Bill Boeing. Um, but that also going into the business when it was just a hobby for him. He, uh, he wasn't concerned about immediately being profitable, making a lot of money, because he already was the, the richest guy in the state. His goal was to make the best airplanes he could. And that was the goal that he started with. And that really uh, resonated throughout the company for for decoration, for, uh, for, for generations. And, and uh, 
for uh, several more decades. And that makes a difference because um, if you are focused on building only the very best, the highest quality, it's going to follow from that that you're going to end up, end up with something that um, is very dependable, has great performance, uh, great longevity, and that in turn will become a very economical uh, and good plane to operate. If you go into it from the other direction, if you go into it with this thought of, well, I'm gonna build an economical plane, then you will be sacrificing along the way. You're gonna sacrifice some of the quality, you're gonna sacrifice some of the performance, and you end up with, with sort of a substandard product. So Boeing had the advantage from day one of going in and just saying, hey, we're gonna build the best that we can and we'll find a market for it. And for, for 50, 60, 70 years, that was the company philosophy. And that's what made Boeing really so successful is that their focus from day one was doing the best that they could. That brings up an interesting question, David, and I, I'm asking you to give a little opinion here, uh, <laughs> you know, about the company as it stands now, because, you know, we're, of course, uh, more than 100 years removed from when uh, William Boeing Sr. was uh, having the guys building planes in the red barn there. Um, how would you say the company today tries to live up to that original philosophy? Gosh, gosh, I'm really sorry, Ryan. There, there's some static on the line. I, I couldn't hear what the question was. Well, let me uh, try it again. How, how no. would you say it's okay? It's, it's Zoom. It's a, a marvelous technology, no, I, but it's I'm, not I'm It's teasing. not perfect. I'm, I'm teasing, Ryan. Oh, you're trying to dodge the question. question. <laughs> Perfectly well. I'm, I'm trying to uh, hone my political skills and just dodge a controversial question. Um, but I do have to say that time marches on and things have changed uh, and it, it would be pretty impractical to found a company now based entirely on uh, simply building the best, highest quality product you could with no, um, with no eye towards the economics of it. Um, Boeing uh, has had a lot of struggles with uh, coming to terms with kind of the, the, the contemporary worldwide economy and having to do business all across you know, Europe and Asia. Um, they they have struggled, and I think their struggles are, are pretty well documented. I'm not in a position. Um, there there was nothing in those 17 boxes of old letters from the 1900s that, that gave me answers to what was going on in the 2020s. But um, they they uh, they need to refocus on quality. They need to refocus on um, on supporting their employees, and probably be a little bit less focused on shareholder value. And they'll find their way back. They'll find their way back. I can only imagine. And full disclosure, to be fair, uh, if I can avoid flying on a plane that is not a Boeing plane, I will absolutely avoid it. I always feel most comfortable flying on a Boeing plane. And it's because of the the long history of the company and the, the quality of the product they do put out. So, you know, I wasn't I wasn't looking to, <laughs> you know, I had no axe to grind there. I I like flying on Boeing planes. Now you talked yeah. about the stuff that's in those totes. Uh, and I'm sure it wasn't all business. Was there any interesting little personal nugget that stood out to you that uh, that we might hear about in the book? Well, sure. And, and something that is, is really significant um, and how it impacted Bill Jr. is that uh, there were a couple of significant kidnapping attempts against Bill Jr. You have to remember that was a time when uh, in the Lindbergh kidnapping had been a huge, huge deal in the news. Um, and then the um, the heir to the warehouser fortune was also kidnapped and held for ransom. And both of those things played into some copycats who on at least two separate occasions attempted to kidnap Bill Boeing Jr. To deal with that, um, Bill Sr. sent his son to live in uh, relative seclusion at a private school in far off Hawaii. And this was in the late 1930s, 20 years before Hawaii was even a state. Uh, but Bill Jr., to kind of protect his son from the limelight, shipped him off to, uh, to Hawaii when Hawaii was just a territory. Another thing that was very surprising, um, Bill uh, lived through the Prohibition era, and Bill was not a supporter of Prohibition. Um, and Bill was involved in at least two, uh, two liquor busts where uh, one where uh, 
state agents raided his home up in uh, in the Highlands and found a lot of liquor and confiscated that. And then it became a, a constitutional battle over whether the liquor raid had been justified. And then there was another uh, situation about 10 years after that where uh, Bill was involved in another prohibition liquor bust where his phone had been recorded without his knowledge. And that made it, uh, that case and the appeal of that case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, so very interesting that the guy that we think of as kind of straight laced and a businessman, uh, he was involved in his own, uh, I, I won't call them scandals because it was, uh, it was pretty well known that there was a, a, they called it a dry contingent and a wet contingent. And uh, now how politics is divided between left and right, uh, back then it was wet and dry. Um, and he was definitely on the wet side. Interesting. I had no idea he had gotten into bootlegging. So another reason to pick up the book for sure. Uh, while I have you, and again, since you are uh, the director of the Hydroplane and Race Boat Museum, I just want to have you give us a little quick tidbit. We'll talk about the museum there. Tell us, I've never been. Uh, now that I'm looking at that boat behind you, I am definitely going to go. What is a guy like me who's never been there before going to find? Well, we are... Uh affectionately called Seattle's best kept secret. We have at any given time, uh, 12 unlimited hydroplanes on display. We have more than that in our collection. Uh, we've restored over the years, 18 different hydroplanes, uh, 18 different gold cup winning race boats going all the way back to 1908. The oldest boat in our collection was from 1908. The most recent one is from 2010 and we've got everything in between. If you grew up in Seattle, names like Bardall, Thriftway, Slomo. Um, Atlas Van Lines, Miss Budweiser may be familiar to you. Well, we've got all those boats and we've restored them all to running condition and we have them on display here, but we also take them out uh, all across the state. Uh, earlier this week on Tuesday, if you thought you saw or heard an unlimited hydroplane out on Lake Washington, you were right. Um, we took four of our boats down and we ran on Lake Washington. Uh, in about three weeks, I'll be over in Tri-Cities running uh, three of our boats, then back to Tri-Cities in July, Sepia here in August, and over on Lake Chelan uh, in October. So we run the boats all across the state, but we, we store them here, we restore them here, and we've got uh, some docents who will walk you through, give you all the details on, on boat racing, and uh, tell you some good stories while they're at it. And where can we find you? Where's the museum located? We are just south of South Center in Kent. Um, the address is... Well, easier than the address would be the website, which is www.thunderboats.org. Our hours, our admission prices, and directions are all on that website. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I will be checking that out. Like I say, I'm a big fan of going out to Seafair. Although for me, I have to confess, uh, it's the oh boy, Oberto <laughs> that I always root for. And it's, you know, because Larry Oberto's always giving me free jerky. So, <laughs> well, we, we have an Oberto in our collection too. Um, and uh, Larry's his own story. He, he's actually uh, living in Italy now. And he is, uh, he's, he's working on developing a, um, a Sicilian based tequila, which <laughs> will, will maybe be something you can sip while you're drinking or while you're eating Oberto pepperoni. But yeah, Larry's a, Larry's a great guy and a good friend of, of mine and a good supporter of the museum. But we need to talk also about the Museum of Light because that's where I'm going to be this weekend. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I was going to mention that. Uh, you're going to be giving a lecture this Saturday. Yes, sir. I'll be at uh, the William uh, G. Allen uh, Theater at the Museum of Light from 2 p.m. to 3.30. I'll be talking about Bill Boeing. I'll be talking about airplanes and World War II um, and all sorts of interesting um, historical tidbits. And then afterwards, uh, I'll be signing copies of the book. And there will be, I believe there'll be a couple members of the Boeing family there as well, which might be fun to meet. Uh, and, and you can hear some of their stories firsthand. Wonderful. I didn't know that uh, members of the family were going to be there. So that is Terrific. I'm very glad to hear that. And again, that's at the Museum of Flight, uh, which uh, is down adjacent to Boeing Field. Uh, easy to find there. And uh, a, the, it's, the author here is David Williams. The name of his book is 
A Gift of Flight, the William E. Boeing story. And again, you'll be able to hear all about it and talk to David this Saturday at 2 o'clock at the Museum of Flight. And as David mentioned, in the William G. Allen Theater, which is right past where you get your ticket. So it's easy to find. You buy your ticket, you march into the theater. I've done it many times myself. So very easy to do. And always there, they always have fabulous lectures. Uh, at the Museum of Flight, and this one is, I imagine, probably going to be near the top of the list. David Williams, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing everybody on Saturday. Excellent. Thanks, David. Thank you.